This is a summary video for AQA GCSE Chemistry Paper 2. It gives you an overview of everything that could come up on the paper and it will allow you to do a last minute cram on the night before the exam. If you're taking GCSE Combined Science, then you can watch out for the green headings at the top of the screen, which tell you whenever there's triple science content that you'll need to skip, or you can use the timestamps in the description below. The first topic in the second paper of AQA GCSE Chemistry is the rate and extent of chemical change. The rate of a chemical reaction is its speed, how fast it's going, and we can measure this in two ways, either how quickly the reaction is using up the reactants or how quickly it is making products. There are two calculations that you can use to work this out, but they're essentially the same thing. An amount of one of the chemicals divided by the time that it takes to either make it or use it up. Either one of those amounts can be a mass in grams or a volume in centimetres cubed. If you're taking higher tier, you should also be able to express rate in moles per second. But whichever one of these you're working with, you're still using the same calculation, an amount divided by a time. To take an example, if we had a reaction that produced 20 centimetres cubed of gas in two seconds, then I would do 20 centimetres cubed divided by two, and that would give me 10 centimetres cubed per second, which is the rate. It's worth remembering that even if you forget how to calculate this rate, as long as the exam board have given you the units, which they often do, then the calculation is actually wrapped up inside it. The word per means divided by, so if the units are centimetres cubed per second, you need to take centimetres cubed and divide them by seconds. You need to be able to plot raw data onto a graph and interpret graphs that the exam board have given you. On a rate graph, the gradient or the steepness of that graph can be used to tell you the rate of the reaction. So in this instance, the reaction represented by the purple line has got a faster rate than the blue reaction because the line has a steeper gradient. We can also say that for both of these reactions, the rate is constant because the gradient isn't changing. On a curved graph like this one, the rate is changing and we can make a qualitative statement about how at the start of the reaction the rate is faster because the graph has a steeper gradient and then gradually the rate slows down. By calculating a numerical value for the gradient, we can calculate the rate. So we're actually still using the same formula that we used before, but even if you forget that, you know from GCSE Maths that to work out the gradient, you divide the change in the y-axis by the change in the x-axis. So here we divide 5 grams by 10 seconds to get a rate of 0.5 grams per second. For a curved graph like this, we can still use the start and the end of the graph to work out an overall or mean rate. So here the graph increases by 6 grams in 10 seconds, giving us a rate of 0.6 grams per second. You can also draw tangents to calculate the rate at one particular timestamp. A tangent is a line that only touches the graph in one place. To be as precise as possible, make sure that your tangent is as long as you can draw it, and ideally use a transparent ruler or put your ruler on top of the curve so that you can see the size of the gap on either side because we want it to be the same size on both sides. So here at four seconds, the tangent rises from two to nine grams, which is a change of seven grams, and that takes 10 seconds. So the rate is 0.7 grams per second. But if we draw another tangent at seven seconds where the graph is flatter and we know the rate is slower, we can see that here the mass only changes by about two grams in 10 seconds. So therefore the rate is 0.2 grams per second. Now we've talked about how to calculate a rate, we need to think about why it might change. And to explain that, we need to use collision theory, which is the idea that chemical reactions only happen when the reacting particles collide with each other, so they bang into each other, and when they have sufficient energy and we call this minimum amount of energy the activation energy. There are five different ways that you can speed up a rate of reaction, and these are by increasing the pressure, increasing the concentration, increasing the surface area, increasing the temperature, or by adding a catalyst. You can increase the pressure in two ways. One is by increasing the number of particles in a container. So if you imagine blowing up a balloon or pumping up a bike tire, where you're physically adding more particles, and the other is by making the container smaller, because the pressure is caused by the particles bouncing off the walls of the container they're in. If the particles are in a smaller box, or if there are more particles in the same box, then it's much more likely that the particles will collide with each other, and therefore a reaction can happen. So we would say that increasing the pressure will increase the rate, because the particles will collide more frequently, 
And frequently is such an important word because the important thing is not just that they collide more, but that they do more in the same amount of time. So it's really important for all of these rate questions that you're talking about particles colliding more frequently or more often or more times per second. Concentration is very similar to pressure, but it applies to solutions rather than gases. Overall, though, it's the same idea. When we have a higher concentration, there are more particles in the same space and therefore they're more likely to collide, so they collide more frequently and therefore we have a higher rate of reaction. Talking about surface area can sometimes confuse a few people. The thing you need to understand is that as you cut something into smaller pieces, you increase the overall surface area. That can be tricky to get your head around because you're thinking, well, it's a smaller piece, so surely the surface area is smaller. But we're talking about all of the pieces combined together. It might be easier if you talk in terms of the surface area to volume ratio, because for the same amount of stuff, we now have a bigger surface area. This might be easier to visualise in 2D. If this green block represents a piece of magnesium sat in some acid, the acid can only react with the outside rim, this 16 centimetre perimeter. But if we cut each side into two, then we expose all these central parts that can now react as well. Even though each one of those pieces individually is smaller than the original square, when we put the four of them together, they still have the same area, but a larger perimeter. So we can increase the rate of chemical reactions by cutting metal into smaller pieces or grinding up marble chips to make powder. Again, this will increase the frequency of collisions. Increasing the temperature increases the rate of reaction in two different ways, and they're both linked to the fact that the particles have more energy. Firstly, increasing the temperature will increase the frequency of collisions. The particles have more thermal energy from being heated, and that's transferred to kinetic energy, which means that they move faster. If you think about walking down a corridor versus running down it, if you're moving at a higher speed, it's much more likely that you'll collide with somebody else. And the same is true of the particles. Because they're moving faster, they collide more frequently. But also, we can think about that second part of collision theory. As well as colliding, the particles need to have a minimum amount of energy called the activation energy. If all of the particles in a reaction have more energy, then it stands to reason that more of them will reach that minimum threshold. Finally, to speed up the reaction, we can add a catalyst, which is a chemical that speeds up the rate of reaction without being used up or changed itself. It's important that you understand that catalysts are chemicals. We sometimes see in exams people writing about heat acting as a catalyst, and that's not true. This has to be a chemical that we're adding. Enzymes are an example of a biological catalyst, which just means a catalyst made by a living organism. The way that catalysts work is that they provide an alternative pathway for the reaction to happen, which has a lower activation energy. To visualise this, imagine that you're trying to visit a friend who lives on the other side of a mountain. For you to get up and over the mountain it takes a certain amount of energy, and that represents the activation energy. Now, there isn't really much we can do to make the mountain take less energy to climb. But if there was an alternative route where you could walk around the bottom of the mountain, that might take less energy. And this is exactly what a catalyst does. It's not that it changes the amount of energy to get over the mountain, it just provides an alternative route that needs less energy. In Unit 5, you learned how to draw and interpret these energy profile diagrams for reactions. So this is an example of an exothermic reaction where the reactants have more energy than the products. And we can draw an arrow representing the activation energy, the amount of energy required for this reaction to start. So if this is my diagram without a catalyst, then when I add a catalyst, the reactants and products will have the same amount of energy, but in between them, we won't need as big of an activation energy. So the very top of that energy profile will be lower, and if I was going to label the activation energy, I'd label it here. The first required practical that comes up in AQA GCC Chemistry Paper 2 investigates what happens to the rate of reaction when we alter the concentration. This is a two-part investigation. You need to be able to describe both how you would do this using a method where you collect gas, and also how you would do it with a method that involves turbidity. The first of these could be any chemical reaction that releases gas, but the most normal ones to do would be either adding magnesium or marble chips to some acid. For each one of these, we need to be measuring the amount of gas that's produced in a certain amount of time. There are two ways you can do this. Either you can collect gas over water by using an upturned measuring cylinder full of water, so as the gas is produced it pushes the water out and you can um, read off the measuring cylinder how much gas has been made, 
or you can use a gas syringe, which is a little bit easier, but also they tend to be quite expensive and lots of schools don't have them available for use. Whichever one of these methods you describe, it's vital that you mention that you're taking readings at regular time intervals, say every five seconds or every 10 seconds, as if you don't do this, you won't be able to calculate the rate. As with all of these investigations, you also need to be able to describe how you would keep other variables controlled in order to make the experiment valid. So in this instance, we have to change concentration because that's the point of the required practical. So I'd be wanting to control things like the volume of the solutions that I'm using and the mass of whatever it is that I'm adding. For the second part of the required practical, you measure a reaction which becomes turbid, meaning cloudy. Every school I know of uses the reaction between hydrochloric acid and sodium thiosulfate for this. But whichever reaction you do, there will be a solid precipitate formed. So if you're given a chemical symbol equation, you want to look for the product which has a state symbol which says S next to it. This is what makes the reaction become turbid. The classic way to monitor this is by timing how long it takes for a cross on a piece of paper to disappear. The faster it disappears, the higher the rate of reaction. This is a perfect opportunity to talk about how subjective human judgment is and how it would be a better experiment if we used a light sensor hooked up to a computer. In some chemical reactions, it's possible for the products to react together to make the original reactants. And we call these reversible reactions. And you can recognize them because rather than a normal arrow between them, we have this funny double-headed reversible reaction arrow. It's possible to change the direction of the reversible reaction by changing the conditions. You should also know that if a reversible reaction is exothermic in one direction, then it will be endothermic in the opposite direction. And there is a named example of this. If you heat up some hydrated copper sulfate, which is blue, you can make a white powder called anhydrous copper sulfate. And that's an endothermic process. You have to heat it in order for it to happen. If you take some anhydrous copper sulfate and you add some water to it, then you can turn it back into the hydrated copper sulfate. And this is an exothermic process. It will get hot on its own. When a reversible reaction happens in a closed system, it will eventually reach a point called equilibrium. And this means that the forward and backward reactions are happening at the same rate or the same speed as each other. When this happens, the concentration of the reactants and products will stop changing. Be careful though. This doesn't mean that the reactants and products are present at the same concentrations as each other, just that their concentrations have stopped changing. So if I was going to look at a graph of a reversible reaction reaching equilibrium, I could identify equilibrium as the point where the graph completely flattens out. If you're taking higher tier, then you need to be able to use Le Chatelier's principle in order to explain how we can move the position of equilibrium by changing the reaction conditions. Le Chatelier's principle tells us that if a system is already at equilibrium and a change is made to any of the conditions, then the system will respond to counteract that change. That basically means whatever I try to do, the system will try to undo. So if you add a reactant, the system will remove it. And if you heat a reaction, the system will try to cool it. Often with these questions, the exam board won't actually give you the names of chemicals because they don't want to confuse you with reactions you haven't heard of. So they quite often just refer to a blue copper compound or a pink cobalt compound. So in this reaction, a blue copper compound reacts with hydrochloric acid to make a green copper compound and water, and this is a reversible reaction. If I add more hydrochloric acid, I know that Le Chatelier's principle has told me that the system will shift to counteract that change and get rid of the hydrochloric acid. The only thing that the system can actually do is make either the forward reaction or the reverse reaction happen faster. So whichever reaction removes hydrochloric acid, that's the one that will go faster. That's the one that we say will be favoured. So in this instance, the forward reaction is favoured. That means that the equilibrium shifts to the right. In other words, I'm making more of the products. Therefore, there'll be more of the green copper compound formed and my solution will start to look greener rather than bluer. The second reaction condition that we can change is pressure. Pressure, remember, is caused by particles colliding with the walls of the container that they're in. So the more particles there are in a container, the higher the pressure will be. If we increase the pressure, this will favour whichever side of the reaction has fewer molecules on it. To answer a question about pressure and equilibrium, I need to look at the chemical symbol formula and identify which side of the equation has more gas molecules on it. In this example, I have three moles of gas in my reactants, but only two moles in my products. So the reactant side is a high pressure side and the product side is a low pressure side. If I decrease the pressure, Le Chatelier's principle tells me the system will shift to counteract that change and increase the pressure. So it's going to move the equilibrium towards the higher pressure side, which here is my reactants.
So here I would say that the backward reaction is favoured because there are more molecules on the left. I need to actually point this out and explicitly tell the exam board that I know that this is why the equilibrium is going to shift. So the equilibrium will shift to the left and therefore the yield of sulphur trioxide will be lower. We said at the start that if we heat up a reaction at equilibrium, the system will shift to try to cool it back down again. And the way it does this is by favouring the endothermic reaction. It's very likely in a question such as this that you may be told that the forward reaction is endothermic, but not told anything about the reverse reaction. You are expected to know that for a reversible reaction, one way will be exothermic and the other way will be endothermic. So in this instance, the forward reaction is going to be favoured because that is what will cool my reaction back down. And I need to tell the exam board that I know that this is because the forward reaction is endothermic. Therefore, the equilibrium shifts to the right, and therefore what I will see or observe is that my mixture will turn white. The second topic in AQA GCSE Chemistry Paper 2 is organic chemistry, which starts off talking all about crude oil. So you need to know that crude oil is a finite resource, which means that it's going to run out, and it's found in rocks and made from the remains of ancient biomass, which is mainly plankton that was buried in sediment. So basically we're talking about lots of sea creatures that died and then mud and sand fell on top of them and turned into rocks over millions of years under a lot of pressure and meanwhile they turned into fossil fuels like crude oil. It's a mixture of hydrocarbons, so compounds that are made of hydrogen and carbon only, absolutely nothing else, and those hydrocarbons are mainly a type called alkanes. Alkanes are an example of a homologous series, which is a group of compounds that have similar chemical properties because they have the same functional group, and they also have the same general formula. If you're taking combined science, then you need to know about alkanes and alkenes, and if you're taking triple science, you also need to know about alcohols, carboxylic acids, and esters. You should know that the names of the first four alkanes are methane, ethane, propane, and butane, and I like to remember this by using the mnemonic, most elephants prefer bacon. The general formula for alkanes is CnH2n plus 2. So what this means is that if we give you any number of carbons, say 8 carbons, we can then use that for n to work out how many hydrogens there should be. So 2 lots of 8 plus 2 gives me a total of 18 hydrogens. These alkanes are all examples of small covalent molecules, and that means that between the molecules there are weak intermolecular forces. As with all small covalent molecules, the larger the molecule is, the stronger these forces are. This means that as alkanes get bigger, they have higher boiling points. They also have higher viscosity, which means sort of stickiness, and they become less flammable. Due to the differences in boiling points, the different alkanes that are mixed up together in crude oil can be separated out according to their boiling point by using a process called fractional distillation. In fractional distillation, a mixture of liquids is added to a fractionating column. At the bottom of the fractionating column is a furnace or a heat source, which heats them all up to an incredibly high temperature. For the fractional distillation of crude oil, this tends to be somewhere in the region of 400 degrees C. At this temperature, almost all of the alkanes are going to evaporate. As they travel up the fractionating column, there's a temperature gradient. In other words, the nearer you are to the heat source, the hotter it is, and as you go higher, it gets cooler and cooler. As each alkane reaches a height that corresponds to a temperature where it can condense, it turns back into a liquid, and this allows you to separate the liquids and use them afterwards. Fractional distillation of crude oil is used to provide fuels and feedstocks for the petrochemical industry, which are used to make solvents, lubricants, polymers, detergents, and of course, fuels. In order to release the energy from these fuels, they are combusted or burned in oxygen, which is a kind of oxidation. And this releases carbon dioxide and water, as well as a huge amount of energy. You need to be able to write balanced symbol equations for the complete combustion of alkanes. Complete combustion means that they're burning in sufficient oxygen for all of the carbon and all of the hydrogen to be fully oxidised. So we're always going to make carbon dioxide and water. If you're not very confident with balancing symbol equations in general, then it's worth learning a method that will work just for the complete combustion of alkanes. Firstly, you're going to look at the number of carbons in the alkane. Here we have propane, so it has three carbons. Now, because the symbol equation has to balance, if I have three carbons on the left, I must have three carbons on the right. And the only molecule on the right that contains carbon atoms is carbon dioxide. So I need to have three carbon dioxide molecules. So I'm going to take this three from the propane and put it as a coefficient in front of the carbon dioxide. Now I'm going to look at the hydrogens. In this propane molecule, I have eight hydrogen atoms. And I'm going to make water molecules, which each contain 
two hydrogen atoms. So I actually need to take that eight and half it. So I'm going to put a four in front of the water. Now I need to work out how much oxygen I need to make this balance. So I need to add up all of the oxygen atoms on the right hand side. Remembering of course that there are two oxygen atoms in every carbon dioxide molecule. So that's two lots of three, so that's six atoms in total. And then each water molecule only contains one. So that's another four atoms giving me ten in total. Now since oxygen goes around as divalent molecules O2, the total number of molecules is going to be half of that. So I add up all of the oxygen atoms on the right to make 10, I divide it by 2 to get 5, and that's my number of oxygen molecules. Now I should probably point out that this method is going to work beautifully provided you have an alkane with an odd number of carbon atoms in it. It will still work if you have an alkane that has an even number of carbon atoms, but the number of oxygen molecules you get out will not be a whole number. So you might need four and a half or five and a half. And although when we get to A-level chemistry we use halves as coefficients all the time, at GCSE we tend not to, we tend to stick to whole numbers. So if that's what you've been taught and it's a little bit confusing for you, there is quite a simple fix. Let's take this butane molecule here which has four carbon atoms in it. If it completely combusts in oxygen it's still going to make carbon dioxide and water. But to avoid that situation where I need a half number of oxygen molecules, before I start I'm going to double up. So I'm going to start with two butane molecules and this is the same thing that I would do for any situation where the alkane has an even number of carbon atoms. So I'm going to look at my four carbon atoms there but then I'm going to remember that I have two of these molecules. So in total I now have eight carbon atoms and I'm going to make eight carbon dioxide molecules. Then likewise I look at these 10 hydrogen atoms but because I have two molecules that makes 20 in total and then I half it so I'm back to 10 so that's 10 water molecules and then again I count up the 16 oxygen atoms in the carbon dioxide and the 10 oxygen atoms in the water which makes 26 in total and if I divide 26 by 2 I get 13 oxygen molecules. We've already described that crude oil is a mixture of hydrocarbons of all different sizes and one problem that we encounter is that there's a really high demand for the small alkanes because they make excellent fuels but actually crude oil contains large amounts of the much much larger alkanes which don't have nearly as many uses. So we use a process called cracking, which is a type of thermal decomposition. In other words, it uses heat to break down large molecules. And what cracking does is it breaks down long alkanes into shorter, more useful alkanes and also another group of molecules called alkenes. You may be asked to complete symbol equations for cracking reactions, but these aren't nearly as intimidating as they look. In the first style of question, we're literally just counting up the numbers of carbons and hydrogens on the left and right of the equation and making sure that they balance. So if I know that there are 25 carbons and 52 hydrogens in my reactant, then there must also be 25 carbons and 52 hydrogens in my products. So if I know that one of my products contains 10 carbons and 22 hydrogens, I can just take those away from the numbers on the left. And therefore I can work out that my second product is C15H30. Another style of question might tell you what the products are, but not how many of them there are. So in this instance, I need to calculate how many ethene molecules are required to balance the equation. So again, I've started with 25 carbons and 52 hydrogens, and I can subtract the nonane that's already been listed as a product. That leaves me with 16 carbons, and I know that there are two in each ethene molecule. So therefore, I must have eight ethene molecules. There are two types of cracking that you need to be able to describe the reaction conditions for and at GCC neither of them mention pressure which is a really common misconception. It might help if you remember that you've probably either done or watched a demo of cracking in the GCC classroom and so there isn't anywhere in that room that you can control the pressure. In catalytic cracking we vaporise the alkane and pass it over a hot zeolite catalyst. In steam cracking there's still a very high temperature but rather than using a traditional catalyst we use steam. We've just said that in cracking we make two types of molecules, the alkanes that we've already met and these new alkenes. Alkenes are more reactive than alkanes and this is because of the double bond that is their functional group. Each alkene is only going to contain one double bond. You shouldn't be replacing all of the carbon-carbon bonds in the molecule with double bonds, you just need one of them. In order to test for an alkene we add an orange liquid called bromine water which will turn colourless in the presence of a double bond.
If you're doing combined science, you can now skip ahead to chapter eight. But if you're doing triple science, we need to know a little bit more about alkenes and also some other homologous series. Alkenes are described as being unsaturated hydrocarbons, as compared to alkanes, which are saturated hydrocarbons. This means that in the alkene, each carbon atom has not necessarily made as many bonds to hydrogen as it could have done. There are two hydrogen missing compared to an alkane, and so instead there's a carbon-carbon double bond. This is reflected in the general formula, which for an alkene is CnH2n. The first four alkenes are ethene, propene, butene and pentene. There's no methene because you can't have an alkene with only one carbon because there wouldn't be another carbon for it to form a double bond to. As we've already said, alkenes are produced by cracking and they can be tested for by using bromine water. You also need to know a little bit of information about the reaction of alkenes. Firstly, they're useful for making addition polymers, including a lot of important plastics like polythene and polypropene and polybutene. They can be converted back into alkanes by hydrogenation using a nickel catalyst. They also react with water with an acid catalyst at 300 degrees C and 60 atmospheric pressures in order to make alcohols. And finally, they can be burned as fuels to produce carbon dioxide and water, but they have a smoky flame, so they're less good as fuels than alkanes are. The third homologous series you need to know about are the alcohols, which have the functional group OH. Their general formula is CnH2n plus 1 OH, and the first four members of the group are methanol, ethanol, propanol and butanol. As well as being found in alcoholic beverages, ethanol is a really important solvent and general reagent in chemical industry. Depending on how pure you need your ethanol to be, it can either be produced by fermenting sugar by yeast in warm and wet conditions, or by hydrating ethene using steam. Alcohols dissolve in water to produce neutral solutions. You might expect them to make an alkaline solution because you're thinking about hydroxide ions, but this OH group isn't an ion, it isn't free to enter solution and raise the pH, it remains covalently bonded to the molecule. Alcohols also burn to produce carbon dioxide and water, and they react with sodium to release hydrogen, which you could test for with a squeaky pop test, although you need to be very, very careful because, of course, the alcohol is also highly flammable. Alcohols can be oxidised either by microbes or by chemical oxidising agents like potassium dichromate in order to make carboxylic acids. These carboxylic acids are the fourth homologous series that you need to know about, and the first four are methanoic acid, ethanoic acid, propanoic acid and butanoic acid. Their functional group is a carbon atom double bonded to an oxygen atom and then single bonded to another oxygen atom that in turn is bonded to a hydrogen atom. If you're struggling to remember which way around the double bond and the single bond go, just bear in mind that oxygen always needs to make the same number of bonds. So double bond on the top and single bond on the bottom means that both oxygen atoms are making two bonds. Carboxylic acids dissolve in water to form weak acids. In other words, they don't fully ionise. This means that they have high pHs compared to strong acids of the same concentration. So if you have a one molar solution of hydrochloric acid and a one molar solution of ethanoic acid, the ethanoic acid will have a higher pH, although still below 7 because it is still an acid. Carboxylic acids react with carbonates to produce carbon dioxide gas bubbles, which you could test for with lime water, and they react with alcohols to make esters. Esters are sweet-smelling, volatile substances, which means that they evaporate easily, so they're used as perfumes and also as flavourings. They're made from a condensation reaction between an alcohol and a carboxylic acid, and if you know the name of the reactants that they were made from, then you can name the ester. You take the prefix of the alcohol and put "-ile", on the end, and then the prefix of the carboxylic acid and put "-oate", on the end. So this example here is methyl propanoate. In the condensation reaction that makes this ester, a water molecule is lost. You've already briefly met polymers in Unit 2, and then here in Unit 7 we flesh this out with a little bit more detail. Alkenes and other similar molecules which contain a carbon-carbon double bond are able to react together to form what we call addition polymers. These are named in the usual way by putting poly in front of the name of the monomer. So for instance here is chloropropene, and so the polymer is called polychloropropene. We can draw the polymer out in full like this, or we can display it slightly more succinctly in this manner. It's important when you're drawing this polymer that you make sure that the bonds are going out the side of the brackets and that you've remembered to include those brackets and the N to show that this repeating unit is happening again and again and again. You should also note that whereas there is a double bond in the monomer, in the polymer we don't have that double bond anymore because it's broken and that's what's allowed those two carbon atoms to make bonds with the molecules on either side of them. In a condensation polymerization reaction, you need two different functional groups. 
This could either be a situation where you have two different monomers, each of which has a different functional group. So for instance, you could have a dicarboxylic acid and a diol, which is basically an alcohol with an alcohol group on each end. Or you can have a single monomer, like these amino acids, which has two different functional groups, one on each end. The key thing to remember about condensation polymerization is that we always lose a small molecule, and it's very often a water molecule. You need to be able to discuss the structure of three naturally occurring polymers. The first one is DNA, which has a double helix structure and is made of four complementary nucleotides. You won't get the mark if you just say it's made of four complementary bases. The base is the bit that here is shown in red, which represents the code, but actually the whole monomer is the nucleotide, and we need to be talking about that. Secondly, you should know that proteins are made up of amino acids, like this molecule here, which is glycine. And finally, you should know that starch is a polymer made from glucose. Unit 8 is the chemical analysis unit, which starts out talking about pure substances. A pure substance in chemistry is a single element or compound, not mixed together with anything else. That's different from everyday life, where we might talk about something like pure orange juice, because it hasn't had anything added to it, even though it's a mixture of hundreds of different compounds. Pure substances melt and boil at specific temperatures, so you can use a data book value to figure out whether a substance is pure. For instance, we know that pure water boils at exactly 100 degrees. So if I have some water and it boils at a temperature that's not 100 degrees, well then it's not pure. Formulations are mixtures that have been designed as a useful product. They contain really carefully measured quantities of all of the ingredients. Examples of formulations include fuels, cleaning agents, paints, medicines, alloys, fertilisers and foods. Another way that you can identify whether a substance is pure and which different substances it contains if it's not pure is by using chromatography. There are several different types of chromatography, but in GCSE you're most likely to have met paper chromatography, which forms the basis of the required practical. All types of chromatography are used to separate out mixtures and then to analyse what is in them. They all make use of a stationary phase, which remains still, and a mobile phase, which moves through the stationary phase, transferring the sample. In paper chromatography, the stationary phase, which doesn't move, will be the piece of chromatography paper, and the mobile phase will be a solvent, and you're most likely to have used water. And that water moves through the chromatography paper, and it will transfer your samples, which tend to be inks or dyes or something. The substances are going to be separated out based on how well they are retained by the stationary phase. So basically, how good is the stationary phase at holding onto them? In paper chromatography, this corresponds to how soluble the substance is in the solvent. A very soluble substance will travel with the solvent for a long distance, whereas a less soluble substance will be deposited on paper after a shorter distance. And something that's not soluble at all just won't even move off the start line. Chromatography is a comparative method. We analyse substances by comparing them to chemical standards, known substances for which we already know the results. This is a bit like fingerprinting. You can't just look at a fingerprint left at a crime scene and know who it belongs to. You need a database of the fingerprints of everybody who'd been in that area, and then you can find out whose fingerprint it was by comparing them. Rather than just eyeballing a chromatogram and saying, well, this spot seems very similar to this standard, we can calculate something called an RF value, or a retention factor value. This is a number between 0 and 1, which tells us more precisely whether two samples are behaving in the same way. It's particularly good for if we don't want to include a sample of the standard on our chromatogram. We just want to look up a number in a book and say, well, is it the same? The RF value is calculated by dividing the distance moved by the sample by the distance moved by the solvent. And of course, the distance moved by the solvent is the maximum distance that the sample could have travelled because it's being carried by the solvent. You can't just have your colour jumping ahead of the solvent front. Since substances have different solubility in different solvents, they will also have different RF values in different solvents. So repeating the chromatogram with different solvents might allow us to separate out substances that have the same solubility in one solvent. Imagine you have a dot on a paper chromatogram made with water that actually contains two different inks. But then when you run the same chromatogram using ethanol, they might separate out. A pure compound only contains one substance, so even if you put it in a whole range of different solvents, you won't split it up into different multiple spots. Paper chromatography is one of your named required practicals, and therefore you need to be able to write a method to explain how it should be carried out.
So to start with, you draw a line on which you're going to put your samples. And as you know, it's really important that that line is drawn in pencil, not pen, to stop it from running and interfering with your data. You're going to place the sample of the standards and also the sample you're trying to investigate on that line. And then you're going to put it so that it's just sitting into a beaker of solvent. And it's really important that that solvent is below the line, because if the solvent comes above the line, then rather than being carried up the chromatography paper by capillary action, your sample would just bleed out into the solvent and you wouldn't get any results. You may want to put a lid on top of the beaker to prevent the solvent from evaporating. As we've said on that start line, as well as your sample, you're going to put some standards that you can compare it to. And then at the end, you're going to measure the distance traveled by everything and use these numbers to calculate an RF value. There are four gas tests that you need to be able to describe. To test for oxygen, we take a splint that's on fire and blow it out so it's just glowing. And if you add that into the gas and the splint relights, then that tells you that it's oxygen. To test for hydrogen, we also need a lit splint because we're going to ignite the gas, in other words, set fire to it. And if it is hydrogen, then it will burn with a squeaky pop. Definitely hydrogen. To test for chlorine, we take some litmus paper and it's important that it's damp litmus paper and then the gas will bleach it and turn it white. And then finally, to test for carbon dioxide, we take the gas and we bubble it through lime water, which is a solution of calcium hydroxide. And if it is carbon dioxide, then the lime water will turn white because it will form a white calcium carbonate precipitate. Now, again, if you're doing combined science, you can skip ahead to chapter nine. But if you're doing triple science, GCSE chemistry, there are a few more bits we need to cover. Firstly, you should be able to describe flame tests, which can be used to identify cations in ionic compounds. You need to take a nichrome wire and rinse this in dilute hydrochloric acid. This means if there are already any metal ions on the wire, those will react with the acid and be removed. Then you place that damp wire into a solid sample of the metal compound or into a solution that contains it. Then you hold this in the clear part of a Bunsen burner roaring flame. The characteristic colours that you're expected to know are that lithium has a crimson flame, sodium has a yellow flame, potassium has a lilac or pale purple flame, Calcium has a brick red or orange red flame and copper has a bluey green flame as seen in this photograph here. Now, as pretty as flame tests are and as much as I like doing them, they are quite subjective. It's down to you as a human to say, well, exactly what shade of red is that? And also there's another problem because if you have two different cations present, then usually the brighter colour will obscure the paler one. So for instance, if you have lithium and potassium in the same sample, you're not going to see the pale lilac flame when there's the bright crimson one. So instead, it's often better to use an instrumental method because usually these are more accurate, rapid and sensitive. So flame emission spectroscopy is quite a lot like a flame test, but using an instrument instead. And what we do is we put the sample into a flame and the light that comes out is passed through a spectroscope. The output that you get is a line spectrum and the different lines indicate different elements and the size of the line gives you a clue as to how much of it is there. The other way that you can test for cations is by adding sodium hydroxide to produce a precipitate, which basically means a solid being formed out of the solution. If you have aluminium, magnesium or calcium ions, then when you add sodium hydroxide, this forms a white precipitate and you can't distinguish between the three of them. If you carry on adding excess sodium hydroxide, so adding too much, then the precipitate that forms from aluminium ions will then dissolve. So you can then eliminate that one. The transition metals also form precipitates in response to sodium hydroxide, and these have got characteristic colours. The three that you need to know about are copper 2 plus ions, which will produce a blue precipitate, iron 2 plus ions, which have a dark green precipitate, and iron 3 plus ions, which have a brown precipitate. You need to be able to describe the tests for three different anions. Carbonates react with acids to release bubbles of carbon dioxide gas. You can then pass this gas through some lime water and if it turns cloudy, you know that it's carbon dioxide and that you had a carbonate. Halides form precipitates with silver nitrate. Remember, halides come from group 7, so we're talking chlorides, bromides, iodides. Firstly, you need to treat the solution with some nitric acid to remove any carbonates or sulfates, because these would give you a false positive. Then you add your silver nitrate. If chlorides are present, you'll make a silver chloride precipitate, which is white, if bromides are present, you'll make silver bromide, which is cream. And if iodide ions are present, you'll make silver iodide, which is yellow. Finally, we test for sulfates by adding barium chloride solution. 
Before we add the barium chloride, we need to use dilute hydrochloric acid to remove any carbonates, as again, this would give us a false positive. As part of the required practical, you need to be able to describe how you would use these tests or a combination of them to identify what a particular substance is. You may need to use flame tests, hydroxide tests, and the anion tests. The next topic is the chemistry of the Earth's atmosphere, which starts off looking at the modern atmosphere. So you need to know that for the past 200 million years, the atmosphere has consisted of about 80% nitrogen, about 20% oxygen, and small amounts of other gases, including carbon dioxide, water vapour, and noble gases like argon. Next, we need to think about the Earth's early atmosphere. Earth's atmosphere first formed about 4.6 billion years ago, and that means we can't be exactly certain what happened because there isn't a huge amount of evidence. Now, your key word here is evidence. We don't want to just be saying, oh, we don't know because nobody was around to see it. That won't get you the mark. We do know that initially there was intense volcanic activity, and that volcanic activity spewed out lots of carbon dioxide and water vapour, and it made the Earth's early atmosphere quite similar to that of Mars and Venus today. Now, obviously, because there were loads of volcanoes, it was really, really hot. So even though there was lots of water in the atmosphere, there wasn't any on the ground, so there weren't any oceans. There also may have been small amounts of nitrogen and ammonia and methane, and that's important because they were key components in the formation of the first amino acids, without which life could not have formed. As time went on, the Earth cooled down, and then oceans formed. So carbon dioxide started to dissolve in those oceans, and then plankton, tiny sea creatures, used that carbon dioxide dissolved in the oceans to make calcium carbonate shells. If you've ever seen the White Cliffs of Dover, they're made of a stone called limestone, and that's made from the shells of dead sea creatures. So that's where lots of this carbon dioxide is locked up, in sedimentary rocks like limestone. Also, when they died, some of those sea creatures were turned into fossil fuels, so a lot of the carbon is also locked up in coal and oil and gas. Over time, these processes led the level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere to decrease quite dramatically. Now, about 2.7 billion years ago, algae started photosynthesizing. Algae are part of the same kingdom as plants. They have chloroplasts and cell walls, but they also include things like seaweeds and microscopic single-celled photosynthetic organisms. These little green cells started photosynthesizing, and as you know, this makes glucose, but it also makes a lot of oxygen, and so levels of oxygen started to rise. And then about a billion years later, the first higher plants evolved, and oxygen levels eventually got high enough for animals to evolve too. Next, we get on to greenhouse gases, and first, let's establish this has nothing to do with the ozone layer. The ozone layer is not mentioned at all in GCSE chemistry, so just park it on one side and forget that it exists. You should know that greenhouse gases have something to do with global warming, but we need a little bit more detail here. Firstly, the three named greenhouse gases in your specification are carbon dioxide, methane and water vapour. These are molecules that will vibrate in response to radiation, and they're responsible for the Earth warming up. Having a little bit of them is actually a good thing, because it keeps our temperature stable and high enough to sustain life. But unfortunately, we now have too much of them, and so climate change and global warming are happening. These greenhouse gases form a sort of blanket around the Earth, and if you imagine that blanket has holes in it, and shortwave radiation like visible light, UV, gamma and X-rays can get through the holes because they have a short wavelength. However, when that radiation reaches Earth, the Earth absorbs it, and when it re-emits it and gives it back out, it does so with a longer wavelength. So that radiation being emitted is infrared radiation. Now that infrared radiation is too big to easily pass back through the greenhouse gas blanket. So although some of it will get back through, some of it will be trapped, and instead it warms up the atmosphere and warms up Earth. And these rising temperatures are leading to lots of serious consequences. Now we need to be specific when we're talking about these. So firstly, as the ice caps melt, this causes sea levels to rise. This can lead to flooding and other extreme weather events, but it's not enough to just say extreme weather events, we need to actually name them. So talking about droughts and hurricanes. Polar habitats are being lost and with them, many species are going extinct. Make sure that you're talking about polar or Arctic habitats, not just saying habitats. In terms of things that humans do that are making the situation worse, there are six key ways that we're increasing the levels of greenhouse gases in the Earth's atmosphere. Firstly, every time we burn fossil fuels, this releases the carbon that's stored in them, increasing carbon dioxide. 
Also cutting down trees, because that way we're reducing photosynthesis, which removes carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, and also because those trees are a store of carbon. And also digging up peat bogs. Peat bogs form in a similar way to fossil fuels, but over a shorter time scale, and again they're a carbon sink. People use peat as fuel or for compost, and so digging up those peat bogs has an impact on carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Now, you might also have heard, because it's generally kind of hilarious, that farming cows is massively increasing the amount of methane, because cows basically fart out methane. Also, rice farming, because you have to grow rice semi-underwater, and there are bacteria that live in that water in their roots and release methane, and also in landfill, so rubbish dumps. Unfortunately, it's really difficult to model exactly what's going to happen because this is a really complex system. So we tend to come up with models that are quite simplified and miss things out or gloss over them and then also speculate and guess. And this can be really problematic. And sometimes media coverage can be biased and only tell part of the story. So we need to look for evidence wherever we can. You should know that the carbon footprint is the total amount of greenhouse gases emitted over the life cycle of a product, service or event. And this could be reduced in a number of ways, like buying resources more locally, so you don't release greenhouse gases while transporting them in a plane, or by using less energy during manufacture, so that you need to burn fewer fossil fuels to generate the electricity. You also need to know, apart from global warming, about some of the other problems associated with using fuels. There are various pollutants released when fuels burn, and as you know, when you burn a hydrocarbon, you release carbon dioxide and water, and carbon dioxide leads to global warming. But if you don't have enough oxygen for complete combustion, then instead of making carbon dioxide, you make carbon monoxide, or even carbon particulates, which are basically soot. Carbon monoxide is a toxic gas which stops your red blood cells from working properly, and carbon particulates cause a phenomenon called global dimming, which literally means the sky is getting darker and less light is getting to Earth. Also, almost all fossil fuels have small amounts of sulphur in them as impurities. So when you burn the fossil fuel, you also burn the sulphur and make sulphur dioxide. And sulphur dioxide, along with carbon dioxide and nitrous oxides, which can be produced when you burn things at a high enough temperature for super unreactive nitrogen from the atmosphere to react with oxygen, all contribute to acid rain. As well as making acid rain, sulphur dioxide and oxides of nitrogen can cause respiratory problems like asthma. Humans use the Earth's resources to provide warmth, shelter, food and transport. Natural resources, supplemented by agriculture or farming, provide food, timber, clothing and fuels. In addition, we can supplement these resources with synthetic resources, which are those that have been made from chemicals. So, for instance, cotton is a natural fibre that grows on a cotton plant, but we now also have fibres like nylon, which is made from chemicals. You should be able to identify whether a resource is finite and is running out faster than we can replace it, so for instance fossil fuels, or whether it's renewable, like wood. And you should also know that sustainable development is development that meets the needs of current generations without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. In other words, using resources in a way that isn't going to mean our grandchildren don't have them to use. Potable water is water that is safe for us to drink, but it's not the same thing as pure water which has nothing else dissolved in it. Potable water needs to have low levels of salts, but it probably does still have some salts in it, and it should also be free of pathogenic microorganisms. But it may have other things dissolved in it, like fluoride ions for dental care, or chlorine as a disinfectant. In order to make potable water or drinking water from rivers and lakes, we start by choosing an appropriate source, then filtering it to remove solid matter, and sterilising it using chlorine, ozone or ultraviolet light. We can also make potable water from seawater by a process called desalination, which means removing the salt. And there are two ways this can be achieved. Either we can distill it by heating it up until it evaporates, leaving the salt behind, or we can use reverse osmosis, where it's pushed through a membrane. Both of these methods are very energy intensive, and this makes them expensive, which is why countries that have access to sources of fresh water tend not to use them. Potable water can be made from wastewater, including sewage, agricultural waste and industrial waste. In order to make potable water from sewage, we first need to undergo screening and grit removal to remove large objects, then sedimentation to split it apart into sewage sludge, which is semi-solid, and effluent, which is the liquid, and then these are treated with anaerobic and aerobic biological treatment where bacteria digest the sewage and leave us with potable water. Industrial wastewater may also need to have harmful chemicals removed. It's likely that these could come up in the context of an evaluation question where you're asked which method would be easier, so you want to think about the number of steps and the amount of energy involved.
If you're sitting higher tier, you need to be able to describe two novel methods of metal extraction, which are increasingly being used to extract copper, because the supply is running out, but the demand is increasing, so the price is going through the roof. These can both be used on low-grade ores, which contain less than 1% of copper. In phyto mining, plants called hyperaccumulators are grown on the low-grade ore, and they absorb the copper into their leaves and stems, and then the plants are burned, leaving ash. The copper can then be extracted from the copper compounds in the ash by using displacement or electrolysis. In bioleaching, rather than using plants, we're using bacteria. Both of these methods have the advantage that they involve very low energy. Phytomining is also carbon neutral, and bioleaching has an advantage over traditional chemical leaching methods in that it doesn't involve nasty chemicals like cyanide. However, they tend to be quite slow, and it may still be necessary to remove lots of rock. Companies write life cycle assessments in order to assess the environmental impact of a product they're making by thinking about the extraction of the raw materials, the manufacture, the use and operation, the distribution, and finally the disposal. Some parts of this can be done quite easily and objectively, like how much water is going to be used, but other things are harder. For instance, it can be hard to know exactly how much carbon dioxide will be released as a result of this product being made, because some of that might come down to the amount of electricity that's used when it's being used, and we might not know that in advance. In addition, it's often the company that's manufacturing a product that is writing the life cycle assessment, so they're sometimes not objective and can be misused to reach predetermined conclusions. Reducing our use of raw materials, reusing manufactured products, and recycling products to make new ones can all help to deal with the growing scarcity of resources, growing concerns about our energy usage, and limited space in landfill. You should be able to describe how glass is recycled by colour sorting, crushing, melting and reforming, and how metal is recycled by melting it and recasting. The amount of effort required in recycling is linked to how pure the final product needs to be, and you may also need to evaluate whether recycling is worthwhile in a certain situation. Corrosion is the breakdown of materials by chemical reactions with other substances in their environment like water and oxygen. If we're specifically talking about iron and talking about it being broken down by water and oxygen together, then we can refer to this as rusting. We can protect metals from corrosion by painting them, greasing them or electroplating them. And in fact, aluminium forms its own protective layer of aluminium oxide, which protects it from further corrosion because it's so hard. We can also protect iron by galvanising it, which means adding a small amount of a more reactive metal, usually zinc, and then the oxygen in the atmosphere will react with that zinc instead of with the iron, and this is a type of sacrificial protection. In addition to knowing from Unit 2 that alloys are mixtures of metals and that they're harder than pure metals, for Unit 10 we need to know the names and uses of some specific alloys. So there's bronze, which is made from copper and tin alloyed together, which is used to make coins, and brass, which is made from copper and zinc, and this is used for the pins of plugs. We can talk about how gold is often used as an alloy in jewellery to make it slightly harder, and you need to know that pure gold is referred to as 24 karat gold, and you can then use other karat ratings to work out the percentage purity of a type of gold. There are three kinds of steel that you need to know about, all of which are basically iron with small amounts of other things added. So there's high carbon steel, which is strong but brittle, and this is used for making cutting tools, and low carbon steel, which is softer and more easily shaped, so it's used for making things like car bodies. Then we have stainless steels, which have small amounts of chromium and nickel, and these are resistant to acids, so they're really good for making cutlery. Finally, aluminium alloys are very useful because they're low density, so they're used for making aircraft. Ceramics are non-metallic solids made from a raw material heated to a high temperature, and there are two types that you need to know about. Clay ceramics and glass are both waterproof and brittle, but clay ceramics are opaque, whereas glass is usually transparent. Sodaline glass is used for everyday uses like windows and drinking glasses and is made from sand, sodium carbonate and limestone, but it doesn't have a very high melting point. So for lab use and also some cooking uses, you may need borosilicate glass or hard glass, which is made from sand and boron trioxide. Polymers are very long chains of repeating units called monomers, and those monomers aren't individual atoms, they're actually small covalent molecules that have formed further covalent bonds between them to make these very long chains. In between the chains, there are weak intermolecular forces, but because the polymer chains are so large, those weak intermolecular forces are comparatively strong, and so most polymers are solid at room temperature. We can name a polymer based on the name of its monomer, so for instance, if you take ethene and you polymerise it, you make polyethene, or if you take propene and polymerise it, you make polypropene. 
The physical properties of a polymer, such as its density and its melting point, will depend on the monomer that it's made out of, but also the reaction conditions that we use to make it, so the temperature and the pressure and the catalyst. For instance, we can compare two types of polyethene, low-density polyethene and high-density polyethene. Low-density polyethene is made under very high pressure at a high temperature with a trace amount of oxygen as a catalyst, and it has an amorphous structure where it doesn't stack nicely together. Whereas if we use a much lower pressure and a lower temperature and a Ziegler-Natta catalyst, then we can produce high-density polyethene, which has a crystalline structure where the strands pack tightly together, meaning that it has a much higher density. Completely separately from that, you need to be able to distinguish between thermosetting and thermosoftening polymers. Thermosetting polymers have crosslinks, which are just a fancy name for covalent bonds between the chains. And this means that the chains can't slide past each other. And so they don't melt when they're heated, they actually char and eventually burn. Whereas in a thermosoftening polymer, there are only weak intermolecular forces between the layers. So these can slide over each other and they will melt. A composite material is made by combining two or more materials. You can still tell them apart as they don't blend into one another, they're still distinct. And this use of two materials allows composites to have useful combinations of properties, like being both strong and lightweight, or being able to resist being squashed and stretched. The two materials making up a composite are called the reinforcement and the matrix or binder. The reinforcement provides the heavy duty structure while the matrix sticks it all together. A natural example of a composite material is wood, which contains soft cellulose combined with a harder substance called lignin. The lignin fibres form the reinforcement and they're surrounded by the cellulose matrix. For a synthetic example, we can look at steel reinforced concrete. Concrete is itself actually a composite because it's made from cement, sand and aggregate or small stones. And concrete has good compressive strength, so it resists being squashed. But if you try to bend it at all, it can shatter and the steel reinforcement has good tensile strength and prevents this from happening. The harbour process is a really important industrial chemical process used to manufacture ammonia for making fertilisers. It's made out of nitrogen, which is extracted from the air, and hydrogen, which is made by reacting methane with steam. The nitrogen and hydrogen are passed over an iron catalyst at 450 degrees C and 200 atmospheric pressures, and you need to be able to explain why these reaction conditions are used. It all links to equilibrium, because this is a reversible reaction. Using a high pressure increases both the yield of ammonia and the rate of reaction, but if we push the pressure much higher, it will be both expensive and also even more dangerous. Using a high temperature decreases the yield, so it means we would make less ammonia. So we want the temperature to be as low as possible, but having a low temperature will decrease the rate of reaction and make the process very slow. So this is why we don't do it at room temperature, we still use a reasonably high temperature, and also why we need the iron catalyst. Once the ammonia is produced, the mixture of gases is cooled so that the ammonia will liquefy while the nitrogen and hydrogen remain as gases and the ammonia is removed. The leftover hydrogen and nitrogen are then recycled back round into the reactor to react again. A large proportion of the ammonia made using the harbour process goes into MPK fertilisers. These are an example of a formulation added to plants in order to increase their yield. MPK fertilisers contain salts that have nitrogen, phosphorus and potassium in them as these three elements are vital for healthy plant growth. Ammonia can be used to manufacture ammonium salts, but also nitric acid can be used as another source of nitrogen. Potassium chloride, potassium sulphate and phosphate rock can all be mined from the ground, but obviously phosphate rock can't be used directly. So something called the Odder process is used to convert this into phosphoric acid, which can then be used as a source of phosphorus. That's it for AQA GCSE Chemistry or Combined Science Paper 2. I hope that you found this a useful summary of all the content that's likely to come up in your exam. Good luck and don't forget to like and subscribe.